You guys didn't think I was done, right? I mean, I know I did the daily uploads for the Road to Success series, but it's application season and you guys loved those videos. So I thought, why not do this again? I mean, it's not daily uploads. We're going to upload maybe two or three times a week, but you're going to get a lot more videos and so many more universities. So let's continue with episode number 11. And for everyone who's watching this for the first time, I mean, you guys are like behind. There are 10 episodes of Road to Success that you guys can watch on the playlist. But today we are talking about Cornell University. And I'm not going to lie, I'm going to be a little biased because I graduated from Cornell. Uh, I did my master's in biomedical engineering a few years ago. So I have so much to share with you guys. In this video, we're going to look at undergrad, grad and medical school admission requirements, as well as the financial aid and scholarships that they provide to international students. And yep, we're spicing things up with adding the med school admission requirements because guess what Cornell has one of the world's best medical schools which is the wild school of medicine so I thought it might be you know fun to take a look at that side of the admission process as well so interestingly enough Cornell stands at a seven to nine percent acceptance rate and out of all of the eight Ivy Leagues it is known as the most easiest one to get in I mean I really don't know where it got that reputation from I applied myself and I thought it was a very, very rigorous process. But nevertheless, around 66,000 students applied for the class of 2026, which is last year, and just about five and a half thousand students were admitted. Now, of these 5,500 students that received their admits, only about 3,000 of them said yes. I mean, what were like the 2000 students thinking? I mean, you guys really said no to Cornell. Now the cost of attendance of doing an undergraduate degree at Cornell is roughly $64,000 per year. So multiply that by four for a four year undergrad degree plus 17,000 on average for living expenses each year. And this doesn't even cover things like, you know, being an international student, if you need to travel to your home country once a year, the books and supplies that you may need to get, maybe some electronics that you will need to buy. So you're looking at, you know, right under $400,000 to complete a four year bachelor's degree. That is a big amount. For a graduate master's degree, you're looking at right under $60,000 per year in tuition fee. And for PhDs, you really don't have to worry too much because those are funded positions. So you can expect your tuition fee to be covered as well as receive a monthly stipend. The good news is on average, Cornell offers about $40,000 per year in need-based financial aid to undergrad students. And the way to apply for that whole process is first, you start off by liking this video because I'm going to go over the steps on how you can do so. Now, while this $40,000 may seem really attractive, the one thing you need to watch out for is Cornell is need aware for international students. And this means that when you indicate on your application that you're submitting to them that you need financial aid, they will consider this while making a decision on whether to accept you or not. But I'm going to leave it up to you guys to decide whether you should or should not ask for financial aid. But if you do decide to go through the process of applying for financial aid, number one, it needs to be indicated on your application. If you forget to do this, there is no way to later tell them that you need financial aid. In that case, you're going to get a big no and a big rejection. The second thing is there's only one way to apply for financial aid, and that is through the CSS profile. You guys don't know what the CSS profile is. I mean, like, come on, are you guys even part of the crazy Medusa family? Because we have one entire video dedicated to this entire topic. I'm not going to go over the whole process, but in a nutshell, it's a separate application that you need to submit when you're applying for need based financial aid. And Cornell uses that to evaluate how much they would give you. And the financial aid for Cornell is really kind of incomplete without the Ratan Tata scholarship. I know that you guys are waiting for this one. It is one of the most, one of the best scholarships out there specifically for Indian students and it is widely known. So the Ratan Tata scholarship originated from the Indian businessman Ratan Tata himself because he is a Cornell alumni and he donates millions of dollars in endowment or funds to fund Indian students to come and study at Cornell. Each year, 20 Indian students studying in an undergrad program get this scholarship and the biggest like disclaimer that I can give you guys is there is no separate application form for the Ratan Tata scholarship and the second part is this scholarship is not for any graduate students so masters and PhDs unfortunately this one is not for you guys but as an undergrad student if you're applying to Cornell and you indicate that you need financial aid and fill out the CSS application form 
let's say that they decide to give you that aid, that aid may come in the form of the Ratan Tata scholarship. So I know it's a little confusing to understand, but I actually interviewed a Ratan Tata scholar a, a couple months ago and I have the full interview in a separate video. So you guys can check that out if you're interested in the details of how this entire process works. So coming to my graduate students, let's look at masters and PhDs. One of the most popular masters programs at Cornell is the MEng program, which is a one year program. And unfortunately, there is limited to no financial aid, especially for international students. Um, I did this program myself and the best that I could find was that hundreds of students compete for maybe a research position or a TA position and I didn't get it. So, you know, I was just kind of focused on maybe you know, performing well in my studies and then, you know, taking care of my education loan later. But on the other hand, if you're looking at a PhD program, you will get a monthly stipend and your tuition is covered in the form of um, the research fellowship that you do as well as a TA position. So in terms of a PhD prog program, you are covered. But since you guys follow the Crazy Medusa channel, I do have one small hack for you. There is a scholarship called the Knight Scholarship, which is specifically for the MEng MBA program students and what this means is students that are currently enrolled in the MEng program which is the one year degree and then decide that they want to continue their education at Cornell and complete an MBA can get a $15,000 scholarship per year that goes into your tuition fee for the MBA program. Now for the medical students out there or students that are prospective medical students, now Cornell's MD program is one of the most popular in the world. And recently in 2019, they introduced something called debt-free financial aid for all students. What this means is if you get accepted into Cornell's medical program and demonstrate that you need aid, they will cover 100% of need-based financial aid. So you can potentially complete your MD for free if you demonstrate the need. Now coming to the application process, because I guess we're kind of going in the reverse order, that's kind of like the first step that you'll take even to apply to Cornell, whether you're doing it as a grad, undergrad, or even a medical student. Now for undergrad applicants, your application process will be through your Common App portal. And it's one, you know, portal that you can use to apply to multiple colleges. There's nothing new about it. The only thing I would say is if you do plan on applying for financial aid, you have to indicate on your Common App application that you need financial aid. Remember, that's the most important thing. Other than the common details, Cornell does have two supplemental questions, and these can vary depending on what major you choose to study. For example, for the engineering-based majors, Cornell asks, questions like why Cornell and kind of diversity based questions. So my tip for you guys would be to make sure that you really go into your program website, maybe look at some um, research labs that you would like to get involved in and be as specific as possible in the supplemental questions. Cause it's very, very easy for admission committees to say that, you know, a student just copy pasted a very generic answer. Uh, something like I want to be involved in the cultural activities and, and blah, blah, blah. This is very generic and this is not something you should be doing. Now coming to my graduate students, you guys will apply through Cornell's own portal and uh, your typical, you know, document checklist, which includes your mark sheets and your test scores, resumes is, you know, required. But in addition to that, you'll need two types of essays, your statement of purpose and your academic statement of purpose. There is a difference between both of these. And as you can probably tell by the name, the ASOP is more technical in nature where you can talk about your um, educational and professional achievements, the projects that you've worked on, and your SOP is more towards your journey. Now, I know that the ASOP can be a little tricky because it's something that a lot of colleges don't ask for. And when Cornell asks for two different essays, it can be really confusing as to what goes into your SOP and then what goes into your ASOP. Because the one thing you want to make sure is nothing overlaps, right? Um, so you guys can check out the ASOP templates at incognitoblueprints.com. Uh, this kind of goes over a step-by-step -step guidebook on how you should be writing your ASOP. And in addition to the guidance, you can also see three examples of students that have actually received Ivy League acceptances using the ASOP and what their ASOP looks like. So with that, it'll help you brainstorm. It'll also help you, um, you know, bring out that creative writing skill in a technical way that's required for an Ivy League such as Cornell. And for my medical students that are looking to apply to Cornell, now unlike a lot of the education systems in other parts of the world, like India and other countries, 
where you can directly do your MBBS or a medical degree after your grade 12. The US is a little different. You have to first complete a four year bachelor's degree and satisfy pre-medical requirements, which means there are certain courses that you have to take. And after that, you can apply for the medical degree, which is the MD program. Now Cornell's MD program does require that you satisfy those pre-med requirements. You'll have to give your MCAT test scores. You'll have to have some letters of evaluation. Um, extracurricular activities are really meaningful and an investigation in the field of medicine, um, some valuable research, and also show that you have the highest level of personal integrity. Now, all of these requirements are, you know, good to have, and it's a great place to start. But honestly, things like extracurricular activities and just saying that you need them can get really overwhelming, whether you're applying to undergrad, grad, or medical, whatever, right? So let's look at some of the activities of students that actually got accepted into Cornell because recently Cornell published an article just going over that entire list and I found it really really amazing like honestly I was like what was I doing with my life when I was 16 years old there are students that contributed to environmental change issues like advocating for climate change incorporating free statewide tutoring services and even building a patent pending AI powered device. I mean, that is definitely over the top. I thought just being involved in the robotics club was enough, but imagine being a high school student who has a patent pending. That's the type of, you know, excellence and extracurricular Cornell is looking for. And on the other hand, on a more lighter note, we have founders of the Bob Ross club and um, a fish keeper who manages aquariums and breeds. So clearly there is a variety of extracurriculars that uh, Cornell looks for. And as long as you're passionate and can relate to why this is important for you, that is what matters. So that's all that I had for this video. I hope that you guys uh, took some key takeaways. And uh, from, you know, I know in the beginning I said that Cornell is one of the easiest Ivy Leagues to get into. I definitely don't feel so. And just being able to experience the whole Ivy League culture and being surrounded by peers as well as faculty members that are, that are there to guide you and mentor you. It is an experience that you carry with you your entire life. So that amount of work that they're asking you to put into your college application is going to be worth it if you get admitted. For everyone who's watching till this very point, I want to continue the tradition of confusing everybody who doesn't watch till this point by asking a very very random question so today's random question is going to be what is your favorite fast food restaurant it can be all the way from haldirams to mcdonald's or chick-fil-a my personal favorite right now is chick-fil-a because i'm tired of mcdonald's and honestly it's been a really long time since i had haldirams but which one is yours comment down below and if you can get this video to 500 likes that would be absolutely fantastic you guys have been killing it with the likes on all of the other videos in fact you know just because i went to cornell and i'm giving you all of this personal experience and advice if we can get this to 1000 likes that would be mind-blowing so let's get that video there and before i end off i do want to address one thing so this past weekend we did the live stream where i went through the entire undergrad common app process and a lot of you guys came in um, we had a great session and it was announced originally that i was not going to make it public um, a lot of students came up to me after that, you know, saying that they missed the session for various reasons. They had exams, time difference, and a lot of, you know, genuine reasons, which I understand. But the reason why I cannot make that live stream public is I do want to maintain the privacy of the questions that students asked because it was very personal and direct. Uh, but just for future references, you know, there I don't think there's any live stream that I'm going to, you know, keep public on the channel. So I would request you guys to join at the time. I'll try to I'll try my best to make sure that, you know, it suits most of you guys. And for those that miss out, you guys don't really have to worry. I mean, the short form of contents that I create for you in these 10 minute videos Everything that I've covered in the live stream will, over the next few weeks, be presented to you in a good, you know, laid out manner that is easy to understand. Like, frankly speaking, imagine watching or going through a three hour live stream where I'm just kind of like looking through stuff and trying to address a lot of questions and you really won't understand anything. So it's to maintain that quality of the content as well as the privacy of the students, which is why it's going to remain private. Okay, so that's all that I had. This video is getting super long, but we're going to do episode number 12 next in a few days. So hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. Watch all of the other videos and like those too. I mean, you know, why not? Um, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.